Like I got into such a cycle of waking up, going to work and working 14 hours and then going home that uh, I fell asleep in the car on the way to work and rear-ended just some lady like at a stoplight just because I, like, I was so drained and just working as hard as I possibly could to make this career something that I could actually make money doing because I still was at such like a low salary that it just, I was living, but that's about it. I just went so hard and went so hard that I, I passed out at the wheel, which like if I fell asleep three minutes earlier, I would have been dead 100% because I took the highway to work. And it's like, yeah, it, it's very important. Work is very important and I'm not denying that, but like it's not very important if you're dead. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to my social life. This is the podcast where you can hear the real stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. Before we get into today's conversation with Ryan Fenwick, there's a couple things that we need to go over first. If you enjoyed today's podcast, be sure to leave us a positive rating and review, share it with a friend, and subscribe to the podcast. We put a brand new interviews every single Monday and brand new takeaways episodes as an audio exclusive where I sit down and break down the most recent podcast episode of the week every single Thursday. And now without further ado, I'm very excited to present to you my conversation with Ryan Fenwick. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to my social life. This is the podcast where you can hear the real stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. Today on the podcast, we are joined by Bava Media CEO and co-founder, Ryan Fenwick. Bava Media is a boutique influencer marketing agency dedicated to representing premium gamers and YouTube personalities. And I'm excited to have Ryan here on the podcast today to talk about his journey. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here, dude. Where I want to start, I want to go all the way back to the beginning. Talk to me about growing up in Detroit. What did you want to be as a kid growing up? Um, yeah, man, it, it's, uh, I think growing up in Detroit, it's kind of hard to find what your passion might be. But I think because it was so cold, it uh, made me be inside a lot more, especially during winter. And so I played a lot of video games, man. I played a ton of video games, a lot of Nintendo 64 growing up, uh, PlayStation 2, Xbox 360. And when that Xbox 360 was out is right around when um, Call of Duty 4 and Halo 3 and Modern Warfare 2 and all these, these like iconic legendary games that changed the industry forever um, were, were popular. And so I would just sit inside and play video games all day. And eventually um, I remember my mom asking me that same question, like, what do you want to do when you grow up? You're, you're failing algebra or whatever it was. Like, what are you doing? What do you want to do? Why aren't you taking this seriously? Right. And, um, my answer, I remember at the time, this was maybe like seventh grade was I wanted to be a, a halo three pro an MLG major league gaming pro in halo three. I wasn't nearly good enough. And I think I was thankfully, you know, uh, self-aware enough to know that that wasn't an option that I wasn't that great. Um, but I, I started watching Machinima Respawn, which I'm sure you might have heard of Machinima on YouTube. They're like a gaming network MCN now. But back then they had this little vertical called Respawn. It was these three guys, Mr. Sark, C Nanners, and Hutch. And they just like hung out on the outskirts of LA and and did like kind of like this. It was like a more so of like a talk show outside um, and talked about gaming culture. And I just thought it was the coolest concept ever. I was obsessed with it. I liked the idea that their job and what they got paid to do as adults revolved in any way around gaming because that just, it, it baffled me. And so when I saw that, I was like, I want to do something like that. And little did I know I'd loop all the way back that now. But yeah, I went through a lot of trials and tribulations to get back to gaming world and, and to the point that I'm at now. But yeah, we can get into it. And it, it was, um, it was an interesting, uh, upbringing for sure you know michigan's super cold but i think the people are great and now that i'm in la it's super warm but the people are like totally different totally you know i don't i don't want to throw anyone under the bus that was born in in la or just california but they're not um always down to earth they're just unique right um so yeah man i uh eventually moved on to um high school hated it college went to a community college hated it moved to a different uh, location in Michigan following my girlfriend at the time. Um, it, we broke up before we even moved, but I already signed the lease. So I was going to this random city for no reason, going to this new community college. It was quite the nightmare, but um, I thankfully met this good roommate at the time named Akil Wade. 
And he was just a good, he was wired differently. He was just a different kind of guy. And he liked different things that I never saw before. I'm sure you guys might have, uh, or you might have heard of um, MLM companies. They're like, I guess, pyramid schemes, right? And he was a part of one of those. So it was a very like inspirational, like outspoken guy that always like had drive. Um, no matter what really was the reality or not, he was pretty passionate. And I remember I was pretty down. It was one of the lowest points of my life going to a college I didn't want to go to, failing all my classes, didn't have a job lined up. Um, and I ultimately ended up dropping out. And it was, it was quite the struggle. Sold like an old drum set I had for some rent one month. Um, and he's like, Hey dude, come to, you should come to this motivational speaking event. Um, it's literally on campus at Michigan state. We didn't go to Michigan state. We went to the Lansing community college near Michigan state. I couldn't get in, but, um, we, we went to that motivational speaking event and we walked in and right when I walk in, Akil says, Eric, come over here. And it was, I think the speaker that night. And he's like, Eric, this is Ryan. And Eric's like, Hey man, I'm, I'm Eric Thomas. I'm a motivational speaker. Nice to meet you, man. Like, uh, hope you, hopefully you, you know, enjoy and are inspired or whatever. I don't know what he said. I don't remember, but I do remember after we talked, he handed me a hundred bucks and I was like absolutely baffled and just so confused. Cause I, I didn't just, I didn't know what was happening. We didn't pay for the event. It was free. And he hands me a hundred dollars and I'm like, what, what, what is this for? And he's like, Oh, the first 30 people that show up tonight get a hundred dollars. And I'm like, why? And he's like, because speed kills. You're on time. You're proficient. You were here early. We were just there early because like, I think we grabbed dinner at Chipotle before and like we were already in the area and like we just showed up. Um, but yeah, he was literally trying to show that like being early and being on time and, 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 you know, proficient benefits you. And so he was literally giving out three grand that night to a, a, a you know, college kids um, that attended an event for free. So it was really cool. And I remember thinking in my head, because I was very skeptical, as anyone would be going to any kind of motivational speaking event, real estate event, anything like that, you're always going to be like, all right, dude, like, I'm not buying your book. Thanks, though. Um, and but after he handed me that money, and I did the math in my head, I'm like 30 people, $100. He's just throwing three grand in the trash can. Like, I don't even have $3 to, you know, throw away. Like, I, that's insane to me. And not the trash can, but he's giving it to people, college kids, but he's giving it away for free. And it just, it, I was like, all right, maybe I'll listen to him. He might have something I should probably be listening to. And although I didn't take, you know, away that night, like an absolute passion of, of, you know, gratitude and like want to want to take on the world. I did realize how insanely powerful he, he was at speaking. It was, he was the most incredible speaker I've ever heard. Um, I've listened to many Gary Vee podcasts and got even to, into like the scummy, like Ty Lopez world at some times and stuff like that. But really like this one moved the room in a different way I haven't seen before. And I already had this weird chip on my shoulder thinking that I was, um, I knew what I was doing in the social media world because I, uh, had been a little bit popular on the app vine. It's like a six second app. Uh, if you remember that back in like 2012, 13, 14. And I had one popular vine really blow up and do well. Um, and I, I did some brand deals for like really, really like 20 bucks. Like I was really undercutting myself, didn't know what was happening. And, but I thought I knew what I was doing running social media, like growing Instagram accounts and stuff like that. So after Eric's speech, I went up, I went up to him I said, Hey man, um, I want to run your, your social media. Is that like, would you have a social media guy who does that? I think I could really help you out. And he's like, I don't, I don't know. My camera guy's up there. Like talk to him about it. Went and talked to him. Long story short, ended up working for, for them for six months for free. Um, I remember a few different times they did give me like 500 bucks like, to pay for my rent and make sure I was still alive. But in general, it was like a free internship for six months. And then they brought me on full time. Um, it wasn't like an incredible salary or anything, but I, I was making enough money to survive. And as any kid at age 19 would do when they get any sort of income. Um, I went and immediately got a Cadillac and it was like probably one of the biggest mistakes ever. Uh, thankfully it worked out and I still have a, a different Cadillac now to this day. And I like, I like them, but in general, dude, I was, I was making like, I, you know, I don't know if I should say, but like under 20 grand a year, it was really rough. And I just took that and went all the way to the Cadillac dealership and was like, I'm rich. Give me a car. 
And yeah, man, it was interesting, uh, an interesting few years. I traveled the world with Eric um, being his D rock. I filmed him and turned it into social media content and posted it on his Instagram, his Snapchat. We launched in March of 2015, I think, um, his YouTube, everything. And it was a, it was a team. It wasn't just me. There was like 12 of us, but I was the social media kid, um, that flew all over. Cause I had no obligations, no kids, no girlfriend, nothing. I was just his D rock. Right. So that was a really cool learning experience because of that. I got to meet people like Gary V when I got him on the ask Gary V show and met people like Elliot. And then that world expanded out into the people that, you know, and true fan and all those great guys. Um, yeah, man, it was, it was quite a pathway of, of, you know, learning. I learned a lot. I didn't save a ton of money because I, I wasn't making a ton, but I learned a ton and I traveled a ton and it really just kind of like brought me out of that rut that I, that I, felt like I was in. And yeah, I, uh, in early 2016, I started watching the TV show Entourage. Have you, have you seen it? I've not watched it, but I'm familiar with the show. Yeah. And I, um, after Entourage, I was like, that's it. I need to be Ari Gold. I need to be, I need to be the biggest agent of all time. I, I'm going to LA and me and the same buddy that brought me to the, the event, the same roommate, we moved to LA together in January of 2017. And the, day that I got there, which by the way, was driving, not flying. I drove all the way three days from Michigan to LA. The day that I got there, I woke up and got a phone call at 7am saying, Hey, Ryan, uh, we no longer need your services anymore. Like we're going to cut ties. Um, cause you're out in LA now. Like you can't even, what you can't work. And in my mind, I'm like, we just travel. I could fly in from anywhere. Right. Um, but it didn't work that way. And literally day one in LA, the biggest, you know, most terrifying city to me of all time. And I had no job and like no pathway. And so for the next three and a half, four months with my few thousand dollars I had saved up in my account, which goes towards the most expensive rent in all of the US. <laughs> um, I looked for jobs and I applied for job after job after job for months and months and months. And then finally got a, um, I remember I had a spreadsheet. I had like, I applied for like 116 jobs one month. And it was just insane. And finally, I got a few different interviews, a few different opportunities. Um, and one of them just seemed really cool. And it was a, at a company called Studio 71. This was April of 2017, so almost four years ago now. Um, but I, uh, dude, when I saw the website and I saw like Logan Paul and The Rock and, and, and Lily Singh and Rhett and Link and all these big YouTuber names, I was like, I love YouTube. I always have since early Modern Warfare two days, I would like record myself playing Modern Warfare two and upload it to YouTube. And I always had that passion, right? So when I started there, the job was for a talent manager, like literal, the literal position I wanted. And they were looking for someone to focus on gaming. And I'm like, I'm your guy. And it worked out. I got the job. Um, I was surviving again and able to live. Uh, I lived an hour and 20 minutes from work. So every single day I drove an hour and 20 minutes from work all the way to the office. And I hated my living situation so much where I was. It was in the ghetto. I hated my roommate again, not the one that, not the original one, but we had a third guy we added in to make rent even cheaper. We didn't like him. And I just stayed at the office all day, every day, even on the weekends, I'd come in from 9am till midnight. I just hated being home. And I loved being able to work on something that didn't require me to like push carts at a grocery store or, you know, bag groceries or like whatever. I was just so stoked to be able to use my brain and make money rather than physical labor. Like I did all growing up. I was, you know, a waiter and, uh, you know, a bagger and all this stuff. So it was just cool to have a job I felt passionate about. And I worked really hard towards it. Um, fast forward, you know, up until mid 2019. So two years went by. And I was running the entire gaming department there. And uh, we had a few employees now under me and I had my own office and it was like literal the dream come true. Um, but I did learn a lot about the company and how it operated. And there were just certain things I don't think I ever would agree with. Um, and I thought maybe I could do it better on my own. So I jumped ship in mid 2019, started up my own company called Bava Media. Um, and just ran with it, man. I ran with the same clients I was working with and, and started partnering with brands and um, working with, with smart people like uh, Chris Paff or Drama. If you know him from like the MTV Ridiculousness and uh, not Ridiculousness, uh, 
what is it called? Fantasy Factory and um, Robin Big and all that stuff. And he was a good mentor of mine to kind of guide me through this path of running my own business. And yeah, man, it's been about two years now. Is it? Yeah, uh, almost two years now. And it's been an absolute blast and I don't regret anything about it. And um, yeah, it's a lot. And that explanation was a lot. Hopefully that's what you were looking for. But, yeah. Um, as yeah. he said, there's a lot to unpack there that I want to kind of Yeah, I touch like on. forgot about huge portions. I was like, oh yeah. And then I was a Viner for a few years. And then I forgot to even mention, I recorded myself playing on video games for years and years on Modern Warfare 2 and World at War and Halo and all that stuff. So yeah, it's just, a lot of stuff happened, but it was, it's, it's a really good outcome. I'm happy with it. I, I have, you know, we're still a small team, but we're, we're, we feel like we're making an impact in the industry and we're not going anywhere. So it's a good feeling. Yeah. So bring me that. Let's go. Let's, I kind of go through that whole story kind of step by step here. We can. Um, so Subway Gaming was, was the gaming channel, at least in the beginning. Yeah. And, uh, and so was that you, was that your clips or were you reaching out to other people and editing their clips? Um, so I, it started as my clips. Um, and then, like I said, I was just a little bit too self-aware enough to realize like, dude, I'm not hitting any trick shots in Modern Warfare 2. I'm not becoming a pro. Like this isn't working out. I'm going to become an editor and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be like the best editor ever. And so I down, I, I remember going to like my older cousin's house and asking him to help me torrent Sony Vegas 2012 or 10 at the time. I don't remember, but I was like, can you help me get this? It's a $600 program. I obviously can't buy that. How did we get this for free? My friend said you could and this and that, whatever. I end up getting this program for free and just teaching myself via YouTube how to edit videos. And because of that knowledge I learned on editing videos, it helped me with the Vine stuff. It helped me with the Eric Thomas stuff. It like, it always just benefited me till this day. I still use Adobe Premiere and like, um, and, and edit certain clips for certain, certain stuff for my personal brand or whatever it needs to be. But yeah, Subway Gaming, that was, that was a deep dive for sure. Yeah. And so I'm just curious, like, if you think that strategy could be applicable to someone today, like of reaching out to other gamers and getting kind of like, even if it's their like Twitch stream and editing social content, like, do you think that's a white space that like kids in high school could like for free reach out to mid-sized YouTubers or streamers and do that? Dude, absolutely. We work with so many streamers and we even offered a service at one point that no longer exists anymore because kids are doing it for free. We offered a service that you had to pay for it and we, we would do it and we'd upload every single day on your Instagram, your TikTok, your Twitter, whatever, um, every single day on behalf of you because they're streaming all day, every day on Twitch or YouTube or whatever. Anyways, you might as well clip it and put it elsewhere. Yeah. And we just got ran out of the market by high schoolers with like a crazy good, you know, editing capability and all the time in the world. Right. So we, we no longer even do that service, but yeah, you're, you're totally right. And it's, it's a smart space to get in, especially gaming right now. It's, it's popular. It's interesting. But so with that in mind, thinking of all these high schoolers that are doing it for free now, how does the market eventually turn? Cause these kids are doing it now because they're in high school and they can live at home and do it for free. But like, how long can they, they can't do that forever. So is it just going to be a constant cycle of high schoolers doing this or like, is the market eventually <laughs> going to turn where, where this is starting to get paid for? Um, there are certain companies that really can do it well. Um, I've met with a lot of tech companies that are trying to eliminate the person at all and just be able to aggregate clips using technology. And so I think that's eventually what's going to win um, with this aggregation clip content. Um, but man, you see some of this stuff and it's like, I don't, it, a robot can't do it, period. Um, and, and I couldn't either, but yeah, those high schoolers could. And I think they'll, they'll use that experience and that knowledge to, you know, now you, you, you've ran this big gamer's TikTok for seven months. Now you can go do this thing and maybe land this job. And it's like, it's what I did with the Eric Thomas socials is I used that as leverage and then went and got the job I wanted at Studio 71. So it, it worked out that way. But yeah, I, I don't, I see it eventually just getting replaced by tech because I've seen some really impressive stuff. None of it's released yet, but I've seen really impressive clipping tech for gaming specifically where it clips certain kills, certain wins, certain everything and creates them into montage commercial style like you can do a lot of stuff with it if you can integrate brands into that too it's like a no-brainer they're going to do that any day over manually doing it with a high school kid and then throwing like a honda commercial afterwards 
it'd be better if you sign up to a program and then and do it through the tech and then you get paid for it. But yeah, man, I, I yeah, I think being in high school and having a passion is like the most powerful thing of all time. The amount of five, six a.m. mornings I had because I had a paper due at eight a.m. and I just couldn't stop watching Call of Duty videos and Halo videos. Like I, I miss that that drive that I had so much because it just was different. Now, obviously I still have drive, but I also have a little bit of responsibility. I can't stay up till 6am because I just want to. Um, yeah, man, it, I, I think any high schooler that has a passion should just be driving and, and pushing on that as hard as possible or, or looking for stuff to become passionate about. hundred mm, percent. And then so that you mentioned too, the Vine account, correct me if I'm wrong, but you started Vine with your cousins, Josh Sands and Mike Hammontree, right? Yeah. Yeah. Josh signs in my cam and tree. Um, we, we were in Mackinac on like a family vacation thing with Josh and Mike's family. And we saw this Viner to this day, he's an influencer that you could look up and I'm, I'm forever grateful for him. But Trey Kennedy, um, ended up holding a contest that said, um, do like a, a popular dance right now. And I'm just going to be, uh, re yeah, revining some of the ones that I like. And so we're like, we're not dancers and we're not really that funny. Like we're funny, but like, we, you know, how are we going to make this creative? And so we got Mike and Josh's mom to be dancing to the WAP song. And then we walked in. I don't think, not the current WAP song. That'd be bad. I think that, like that, I think there was a previous one back in 2014 um, and they were dancing to that. And then Josh and Mike walk in. I was literally just filming it. I wasn't even in it. And they just walk in they're like, what are you doing? Oh my God, your our mother's like, what are you doing? And it just, um, I don't know, it was funny to us. And so we posted it, Trey Kennedy revined it. And literally overnight, it was like the coolest experience of all time. It was on Josh's account. He got like 2000 followers overnight and tons of engagement and likes and the post was going nuts. Um, Mike was also um, kind of a part of that process to where he was tagged in it and I was tagged in it. So we both got like 500 followers and it was just cool. I wasn't even in it, but I still got the push from that. That's how powerful vine was at the time. Kind of like these beginning few years of TikTok were super easy to grow. Right. Um, it was just such a cool experience. I never felt like that before, but it was, it was awesome. Yeah. We started doing that and just rode with it. I think it was like a three-year run. Um, we ended up getting like a manager at one point and I cringe when I look back at my emails. I'm like, dude, I signed this contract three weeks ago with you. I haven't gotten any brand deals. What's up? Like I had such a big head at the time and thought like I was deserving of, of, you know, these $20, $50 brand deals. That was insane. But um, yeah, it was a, a really cool learning experience. We went to New York at one point for a big New York super vine. And that was pretty cool to just like see people enjoy a culture that was so small still like vine was still such like a niche thing. It was so small. And we all stood up on a wall, like all the viners and then all the fans like stood up and screamed. And I felt like I was like Justin Bieber for a second, but yeah, it, it wasn't really what it, what I think it was. I think just everyone was there probably to see the other viners and me and Mike and Josh were like the bottom of the barrel. Um, but it was, it was cool. And I think if, if I became too big, maybe I would have been down that influencer route, which I don't know if I would have been good at. So because I was small enough to like have a chip on my shoulder, but not big enough to make any meaningful money, it drove me towards like the filming editing aspect and why I started working with Eric. Mm -hmm. But you had one super viral vine, right? I believe I have the day written down here, uh, December 9th, 2013, it was your buddy sleeping in class and you pulled yeah. his arm out from under him. And so that would have been around the time I think you hit 20K on, yep. on Vine. And I looked and I, cause I found your old Vine and 5.8 million loops on that video. What is that like when that's happening to you in real time? Is that like every movie montage you see where the guy's going viral and it's just like numbers flashing by on the screen? He's like losing his mind. Yeah, I couldn't sleep. Up. I couldn't sleep. My phone would sit there and I wouldn't put it on silent either. I would, my phone would sit there with my, my Vine page. I'll just lay it flat on the, on my bed like this or my futon. I slept on a futon at the time. And I laid it flat and I would just stare at it on my Vine page and just go like this and swipe down and refresh the page and the follower count. Like it was like literally, it was like a follower to a second. It was the coolest thing I've ever experienced in my life and I'll never forget it. Um, but yeah, there's like a few cool backstories about that. Well, cool and very unfortunate backstories about that specific Vine. 
first of all, there's a kid in the back that if you rewatch it, there's a kid that flips off the camera, um, which a lot of people comment about till this day. Like, oh, look at the kid in the back. He flipped off the camera. He was supposed to hit his head. Yeah, okay. So in general, it wasn't even real. And that's what, it wasn't supposed to be real. It was supposed to be like a skit, you know, like comedy skits that you see on Instagram now. It wasn't even supposed to be, oh my God, my friend's sleeping when we prank him. It was supposed to be like, the caption was called Mondays. And it was supposed to be like a, I don't know, like a, a skit. And it just, yeah, we, we tried it with this one kid. And I was like, I don't know how else to say this, but you're not hitting your head hard enough. And it's not funny. And so my buddy, Matt, the guy that hit his head, really went all out for it and just slammed his face into the desk. And it was really, it was loud as shit. And it, it, it created an impact. And it, it, it was just funny. And it, and it blew up literally right when we posted it. It started doing really, really, really well. And he gained like 6,000 followers from it just from hitting his head. And I went nuts from like, yeah, 18,000 to like 40,000, it seems like. And it, it kind of just kept driving forever. But that was posted before Vine loops were even a thing. So I have no clue how many it got before Vine loops started. Um, I remember one website, it was like a third party website off of Vine said like 49 million. And then after Vine Loops came out, it started adding them, but it just had a plus sign afterwards, which shows you that like, it's more, we just don't know what it was. Um, and yeah, it was, it was the coolest, coolest feeling ever. But yeah, that Vine was definitely my, my king of the crop. It was the best one. And because of that, I got reached out to a lot of different um, companies about it to try to buy and own the rights to it. And so I got, I got an email from, who you might know to this day, I'm not sure, is Juke and Media. And they emailed me and said, hey, we want to buy your rights. We'll give you and Matt Ramey each uh, $250 for the Vine, for the rights of the Vine. I was like, okay, like, what do you mean? And they're like, we just want to be able to use it in YouTube videos and stuff. And I was like, yeah, people are already posting it anyways. Why wouldn't I take money to, to yeah, to, of course, of course. Where's the contract? Send it over. And so they sent over the contract and um, I, I sign off my rights. Don't read anything obviously on the contract and just say, here, it's all, give me, you know, PayPal me the money and I'm all set. And that's what I did. And for years I was totally fine with it. No worries. Fast forward to 2017 when I land that job at Studio 71, it's a YouTube network. It's a management company. You can see some pretty powerful stuff on that back end of their system. Um, one of those things being, revenue on, on certain clips that are aggregated across different channels and stuff like that. And I had my buddy, the head of the network at the time, find that clip of mine, that vine and say, wait, so you're telling me like every time it's placed in a video that earns revenue for that person? He's like, yeah, of course. And you split it like for vine compilations. If that vine compilation video on YouTube made a thousand dollars and there was 10 Viners in that compilation, they all split that evenly, $100 each. It's split evenly between whoever's in that video and whoever's Vine gets you know, in that ecosystem and claimed by the network. That network now for me wasn't me, it was Jukin. So every time they saw my video, they're putting a claim on that YouTube video and getting part of that revenue. Over the course of since I hit my head or since he hit his head, to 2017, it made over $80,000 just on YouTube. And then a year later, um, I saw it on ridiculousness. So I was just like, all right, well, they sold it to MTV for rights and probably got paid for that. They um, made up to upwards of 80 grand at bare minimum on, on YouTube. Who knows what else other like websites or like China based companies they sold it to like, you don't know. And not that I could have done that. But the YouTube part, I could have done for sure. I could have done it and I just didn't know. And yeah, so I kept my 250, my $250 and they had their 80K in their pocket. And I really felt like a, a big, yeah, it was, a, it was a, like a mistake, but I just didn't know. I wouldn't have ever known until 2017. So. And so jumping kind of around in the, in the timeline here, but so now with your own company, how do you let that experience kind of influence the way you manage your, your clients? Um. Ownership's super important. And I, and I always try to take it as, as talent first, creator first, and like make sure they fully understand how they're operating their own 
channels in their own business, right? Because at the end of the day, it's still theirs. We are an asset to them. Um, but I'll tell you what, there's so much more knowledge in the space than there was back in, in, in 2014. Like there's no, the manager I mentioned, his name was Mike Lemieux. He's still to this day dabbling in the social media world a ton. And I, you know, I'm glad that he ended up where he's at, but he, um, he was like one of the only ones I knew at the time doing brand deals and, and representing talent. Um, I'm sure I was at the bottom of his roster, but it was, um, I just thought it was cool to say I had a manager, but now being on this side of the coin and, and knowing what I know now, I think it's uh, a lot with a lot of these younger kids, you can tell, you can tell that there's a lot of um, empty knowledge for them to still learn about this ecosystem. And so I try to do my best to educate them on how, things operate and we have a full team that can create companies for them, run their taxes. Like we're, we're running their business with them rather than buying their, their clips and, you know, claiming their revenue on behalf of them. Right. So um, yeah, I think w- what we're doing is trying to just educate the talent as much as possible, but man, there's a lot of YouTubers out here now that just, they're wicked smart and you can learn almost anything on YouTube. So they just educate themselves off of being a creator and a YouTuber and asking their buddies, what do you do? Who do you work with? What brands are you, you know, you can learn so much faster than you could back then. So, um, it, it, I, we're still here to help for sure, but the, the self learning capabilities are just wildly different. I just didn't know back then. Was that early management company that you worked with? Was that Instafluence? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was Instafluence. Um they eventually got bought out by Maker Studios. Um who eventually got bought out by Disney. And I don't think they operate in the same space at all anymore for sure. But yeah, what Maker Studios was one of the big competitors to Studio 71 when I worked there. So it's just cool to know that all right, well, at least like my money's still flowing into this business I'm in, but it's not my company I worked for, but um, still, uh, yeah, that was Instafluence at the time. I have no idea how I'd love to like pick Mike Lemieux's brain now. Cause I haven't, I haven't talked to him since 2015 when I was in the vine days, I haven't talked to him since. And I probably would like to apologize to him because I'm rereading these emails and I'm like, where's my brand deals, man. And it's just, I hate reading them. I, I literally went back and I'm like, what kind of person was I? sending emails thinking I had a right to pressure him into getting me deals when I was clearly the one that really couldn't push much an audience compared to his million follower talent and viners that he actually was managing. Jumping around a bit here. Do you want to talk about rise clothing? Sure. Yeah, that was, um, that was, uh, 2014 as well. That was like mid vine days, breaching into Eric Thomas days that that like lowest point of my life period I told you about. Yeah, that was a part of that. And that was that was a cool experience as well. Um, I think once we started to realize that our Vine viewership and poll was a little um, capped at a point like Vine started to finally go on the downturn, and we weren't growing anymore. We're like, all right, well, we're not famous or big enough to make like a living on Vine as an influencer but we really wanted money. And like, it was just me, Mike and Brandon and, and Josh. And we're all, we've been friends since forever. We've grown up together and we wanted to make money doing something. So we said, all right, well, what the audience we have left, let's promote a product. What do we promote? And like any, literally, I think any high school kid that's like, what do I do? I want to create my own business is they start a clothing line. And so we started a clothing line. I was a huge fan of Tommy Bahama, uh, that brand, even though it's literally like probably the demographic of a 70 year old plus, I really liked it. Um, I liked the Hawaiian feel, the calm tropical stuff. Right. So we literally just made our logo, a simple palm tree paid like 50 bucks for it. And then we went and filmed this commercial at Josh and Brandon's parents lake house, um, and paid like the, the model, like 40 bucks and a burger and paid like the videographer like 20 bucks and and like yeah just dinner and like yeah it was just super super i think we each put in like 80 dollars into the company and that's how we started it so there was like 
$200 ish in the business bank account that we started. And it was real low to the ground, obviously. And we didn't really understand what that really meant at the time or what cash flow you need to run a business. We had a, a premium Shopify account and it was $70 a month. And after we got charged like three times and our account went down to zero and we had no sales, we're like, what are we doing? We can't sustain this. This is not good. And we just like ended it. I think the launch day was the only time we got like meaningful sales. It was like 500 bucks. Um, and that was about it. It was cool though. Like we, I, I somehow we got in the Naples, Florida, like newspaper and I read that really. Yeah, yeah. man. It, like, I, I think I saw that newspaper till this day. It's just, yeah, it was cool to just be passionate about anything and everything. And I think we just wanted money. We watched like Wolf of Wall Street. We really were just driven to like do something. And so we just kept throwing stuff at the wall. It's what you got to do. And eventually something will stick. But yeah, it definitely wasn't the palm trees or the vine careers or the, you know, the video game editing. And yeah, it's always going to be something. But we just kept trying. That's the exact reason I asked you that question about the clothing company is just for people for like, especially younger kids to hear, like, just you were trying everything and just figuring it out. Right. Cause so many people just feel like they have to sit and figure out what their passion is, but you actually figure it out by doing it. And then yeah. I interviewed Tyler Babbitt and he was saying how doing what you don't want to do also shows you what you do want to do. Yep. You know what I mean? So that's what I was 100%. asking. So that's what I was asking just to see kind of like all the different things you tried and before finding what it is you wanted to do. And I want to talk about ET again for a minute. Mm -hmm. I have some stats here when you were running his socials, Instagram went from hundred K to 400 K Twitter, 100 K to 300 K. He got him verified on Twitter, Facebook, hundred K to 400 K YouTube, 200 K to 600 K. What were some of the things you were doing that absolutely made his socials pop off? I mean, he, dude, he was such like, even before he started posting anything before I came on board before years before that he's been motivational speaking since like the late nineties probably not late now, like early 2000s. Um, and just speaking to kids at Michigan State University, he was, you know, in a GED program speaking to kids about how to succeed in class and stuff like that. So his true like 10,000 hour rule of like putting something time in, he reached 10,000 hours before someone even like had a camera phone. So I did, he was just so wildly talented. And I'm, I don't want to take the credit for like everything I was doing. Cause it, I, I think you would have blown up regardless. Um, there's obviously certain tricks and, and things that we did and that were clever, but man, he's just a talented guy and, and a talented team behind him. But specifically when I hopped in, the things that I saw gaps in is what I, is what I pushed on. Vine was already, I think on the down curve. So I didn't push on as much on that, but Snapchat was still very, very popular. So we launched that um, and grew that from like zero to I don't know. It was, it was a ton. It was like 70,000 views in the first few weeks or something on every story. And so that was awesome. Um, and, and we created a lot more content than he was before. I think before he was doing like one or two posts a day back then we were doing like six to eight, uh, when I, when I hopped on and I don't even know if that was genuinely my idea. I think they saw me and they're like, this kid's young and has nothing else to do. Let's get him to do everything. And so I started just editing and posting clips nonstop and we stayed consistent with it. Even on the Snapchat, one of his big things was waking up early and grinding and, you know, never stopping right. He would wake up and this was genuine, real. He would wake up at 3 a.m. every single day. It's when he would wake up and he'd go for a walk for like a mile around his neighborhood and, and pray and do whatever he needed to do, gather his thoughts. And then he would start his day around four. And he would just like start walking on the treadmill, working out, taking phone calls. Um, and then his day, like at, by the time everyone's up at like seven or eight, which is still feels like early to me now. Um, by then he's already done like everything he needs to do. Now he can work with the rest of the employees that are just now waking up. They can go film videos at the office, stuff like that. So every single day he woke up at 3 a.m. And that was whether someone's recording him or not. He just did it. And it sucked when I stayed in the same hotel room as him and stuff, because it's just like, I'm going to sleep and he's about to wake up soon. So it just, yeah, it never, um, never was like a fake facade. Uh, Cause I know like Mark Wahlberg had his little like two or three or 4 AM like niche for a little bit, but I think he admitted that it was only like for a movie for a month or something or something he did, but 
Yeah, Eric was nuts, man. It's 3 a.m. every single day. What I'm getting at is he um, he didn't have Instagram on his phone. He didn't have Snapchat on his phone or Twitter or Facebook or any of these apps. He had nothing. He just had his phone to call his friends and family, business, whatever. But he didn't use social media. We used social media to promote him and make him a brand. And so when I had to run a Snapchat, there was no such thing as Snapchat memories yet. Um, and there's definitely no such thing as scheduling anything at all. And so all content had to be completely authentic and you couldn't upload content yet. Like photos, you could just, if you wanted to take a picture of like a, or if you wanted a black screen, you just had to take a picture of like your hand or your bed sheets or whatever. Right. Um, so every single day I'd have to wake up at 3 AM, not with him, but at the same time as him wake up, go on his Snapchat, take a picture of like my bed sheet and pitch black in my bedroom and type some motivational speech while my eyes are barely open and then post it at 3 a.m. and say like, well, you know, ready to grind, wake up. And then I put my phone on and I'd obviously just knock out and go back to sleep. But I did that grind for like, who knows how long, it, probably a year and a half. And he, I remember one time he finally recognized it. He's like, hey, I see you're doing that 3 a.m. thing with me. Um, someone sent it to me. That's awesome. Like, keep it up. It's growing a ton. And it really was. So stuff like that was just um, the consistency and, you know, how e much easier it was to blow up on those certain platforms at the time is probably what did it. But yeah, I think the YouTube stuff was going to blow up regardless. Like his videography and editing team were just phenomenal. Um, the Instagram clips, like those were going to blow up regardless. It's just, I think the consistency at the time and posting a lot of content is what the key was. Speaking of YouTube, he, he's the one that did the speech about when you want to be successful as badly as you want to breathe, that's going to be successful, yeah. taking the guy to the beach. Yep. I can remember being 16, maybe 17, sitting in like the computer lab in my high school before a basketball game I was able to play. And our coach like made everyone shut up. And she like played this video and just like made us all watch this ET motivational video before going out to play a game of basketball. So it was like a playoff game or something. And that was the pump up speech it was like an ET video instead of a speech. So it was... It was just like, I could do you talking about like you two would have blown up regardless. Like that was probably like 2013. And so like, yeah. it was just like, no, dude, that, that guru story of taking the guy to the beach. And like, if you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, then you'll be successful. I, it's crazy. You remember that. Cause I, when I run into people that have just seen him before, not even like fans, cause I don't know if you watch him, but just people that have seen it before that I asked him, I said, do you remember where you were when you saw that speech? And a ton of them say, yeah, a ton of them. And me included, I watched that speech probably seven years before I worked for him. And I remember being on my dad's computer on Facebook, just scrolling and it just popped up. It was just there. And I watched it and I remembered watching it for someone to like be able to find that memory in their brain. It must've been such an impactful moment and video. Um, yeah, that, that's crazy, man. Yeah. He, he made a huge impact and still does on, um, on the athletic world. So I think any high school basketball team or football team or whatever should always be watching it. Cause yeah, he, he speaks at the NFL. He's really good at that. It's, um, it's just so much. Yeah. It's super motivational. I don't know if like, did you ever get into that kind of realm of like Gary V videos, Eric Thomas, Tony Rob, anything like that, or mainly Gary V big Gary V Ty Lopez very briefly when I was first trying to figure that whole world out. Like when did I you first do the 67 went, step program. No, I never did any. I've never paid okay. for anything. So I was like, okay. I just, I think it's just I'm too cheap. Um, but I was definitely into like, I can remember like sitting down and watching a Ty Lopez like live streams, like an hour and a half and taking notes. And like, but then eventually I found Gary V. And then I was like, I don't need this Ty Lopez guy. I'm all in on Gary V. And then I had like yeah, a, Gary, no. a heavy Gary V phase for like probably two, three years. Same. Um, but yes, yeah, so that was Gary V was my, my guy for sure for the longest time. Yeah, man. I, same thing. I was a huge fan. And I remember um, Eric's right-hand man, Eric Thomas's right-hand man, CJ, called me one day. He's like, hey, listen, there's this guy, Gary. He's really hot right now. He's blowing up. He has 30,000 followers on Instagram, and he's just blowing up a little quicker than we thought. He literally just went from 20 to 30 in like a night. So I don't know what's going on, but don't let him pass us. I was like, dude, get out. Like, yeah, okay, got it. Don't worry. Thanks, CJ. I don't need your notes. Thank you. And holy crap, was I wrong, man. <laughs> That's it. Gary went on a rampage for years. And as soon as I uh, started seeing that, and I saw that first video of him, I think speaking at a college and he had like 
some gray like Harvard hoodie on or something. And his, his uh, strings on his hoodie were like wildly long. I don't know why I remember that, but they were like really long. Um, as soon as I saw that speech, I knew he was different because he was just so brutally authentic and like truthful to what he was saying. And I didn't feel that at all with Ty Lopez. I just felt like he was scumbagging me the whole time. Um, but yeah, as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, this is, he's going to be huge. And so I, when he really started to blow up and D-Rock jumped on board and everything, I tuned into one of their live streams when he released the Ask Gary V book. I think that was in 2016 or maybe 2015 when Ask Gary V book came out. Um, Probably 2016, and, yeah. Yeah, 2016. And I, I tuned into one of the live, the, the launch live stream and he, he was doing like promotions. Like if you buy... 25 books I'll, I'll write you a letter if you buy 100 books i'll do this or whatever and i'm sitting here like dude a book is 30 dollars um i'm not i can't buy any books um but i did remember um if you buy five books you get a little discount and it's exactly a hundred dollars a hundred dollars even and so if you um i i commented it wasn't like a preset offer that i already had but i commented i said i'll buy five books if i get a five minute phone call with drock Cause I'm like, dude, I'm not going to like get a five minute phone call with Gary. Like that it's, that's, that's the thousand book range. Like I, I can't get it. So I was like five books. I'll buy them right now and show you the receipt. If I can get a five minute phone call with D rock and Gary read the comment. He's like, done, done D rock, write that down. Ryan Fenwick wants five, five books. He wants a five minute phone call with you done. No problem. Just email the receipt to this. So I was like, okay, cool. I spend a hundred dollars, which I did not have to be able to spend. That was ridiculous, but I really wanted to make something happen between Eric and Gary. I wanted them to work, like do an ask Gary V together. Um, and Eric did, and I wanted to go out there and meet Gary and the team. And like, I wanted, I knew I'd be a part of it if I got him to go. So they probably had like selfish reasons, a part of it, not just getting Eric in the room with them. But, um, I got the five minute phone call with, with D rock. And I said, Hey man, I'm the D rock of Eric. We got to make something happen. And thank God, uh, D rock was such a, a big fan of Eric already that it made it easier for him to understand why this was a, a good thing. And he's like, yeah, no, I agree. Um, you will make it happen. No, don't worry. And like, yeah, it just, we hung up and nothing happened for like months. It was, it was such a long wait and like nothing happened. Finally, we got Eric and Gary to follow each other on Twitter. And then I went onto Eric's Twitter and I was like, Hey, bro, like, Hey brother, how's it going? Like acting as Eric, like I, I got to get this ball moving, you know? And yeah, long story short, we eventually scheduled to go out there for the ask Gary V show. Um, and yeah, Eric, his right-hand man, CJ, uh, my roommate that brought me to the event in the first place and myself all went out there. We got to go in the office at the, it was the brand new, um, Hudson yards, office that they just just moved into his office like just got being built um yeah we got there and it was like just a surreal moment i was so happy to be there i remember like eric making sure that i ordered an uber black suv to make sure we're like he's like we got to look good we can't you know this is gary v we can't mess this up and so yeah we went there and we filmed the show i think we were in there for like literally a max of 40 minutes if that and then um Gary's like, all right, got to go later. And he was just out. He just straight up left. I mean, he shook everyone's hand, but he was out. Like I couldn't see him. And I was like, dang, I didn't get a photo. It's like 90% of the reason why I wanted to come here. I wanted to get a photo with Gary V and post on my Instagram. And I was, I said that to CJ, his right hand man. CJ's like, Oh, come with me, come with me. And I was like, okay. And we follow CJ all the way into, um, like where we saw Gary go around that area. And we saw Gary in a conference room with like 40 other people at one of those long tables, like you'd see in a movie. And, um, we walk in and see, there's like, Gary, my, our guys, Ryan and Akil, my roommate, uh, they wanted photos with you, but they didn't, they couldn't grab it. Can you, can they grab one real quick? And he's like, yeah, of course. And all these business like CMOs and like a Vayner are just sitting there like, dude, what the like, come on, are you serious? And he took a photo with us. And that's the photo on my Instagram in 2016 with me hold my camera. And like, I was so stoked and happy about it. And that was it. Um, and right before we left, right before we left, Akil, the roommate I was with, um, he screamed to Elliot at the time. He's like, what's your phone number? And he's screaming across the room because we had to go. And 
we got Elliot's number and we stayed in touch. And if, if we didn't do that, we would have never known Elliot, would have never known Swish, would have never been on this podcast, would have never known Buster. Like that whole community opened up because we, we built that relationship and went there. So that was a really cool, like memorable trip. Um, anywhere from getting, you know, to meet Elliot and D-Rock and all that whole team and Tyler and Babin. And no, Babin wasn't there yet, but that team to like Eric left his toothbrush and like D-Rock had to like run it downstairs to us. So that was weird. Like this one, I'm really glad I remember that vividly. I also remember I'd hit record on my camera when we were walking in the lobby of the building and I didn't hit stop until we walked out. So I have the whole thing still in memory and I can always go back and look at it because it was cool. That's awesome. I love how it was like buy 25 books for a note. And now it's like, if fast forward today, it's like now buy $10,000 or 10,000 books for dinner. Like he's still doing the same thing, but the numbers are just so much higher because he's so much bigger now. He's so, so big. Hard. Yeah. But I, I knew I could get it if D-Rock was the the prize, right? And I was so glad it worked. And yeah, now, now me and D-Rock have our friendship and Elliot and all those guys. It's cool to see how it evolved. And I, it was cool to also find like other people doing what we were doing um because i was in michigan pretty secluded they're in new york i'm sure there's tons of people doing exactly what they're doing or la or whatever right but yeah it was really cool glad glad i made it happen but even gary's talked about like early on with d-rock they'd roll into places and d-rock would be following when people like what are you doing so like did you guys experience that obviously being in michigan where you're rolling around following eric and everyone's like what are you doing it's because he was a motivational speaker it was kind of a different dynamic no, like people like looked at it all the time. No one usually ever said anything, but I rarely actually filmed him in Michigan. I was the the social media guy all the time. And then when we traveled, I was the camera guy because I was the one with no obligations, no kids, no family, like all the other employees. I was the youngest one in a company of 12 um, by far. Like the next youngest was like 28. And so everyone already had obligations. I, they can't just wake up randomly and be like hey we're going to houston this morning and i could i would i loved that and it was awesome it was like the first time i ever flew first class was like a huge moment because of him and he's just such a good dude man like he yeah we were literally driving we were in utah driving to the airport back from some event for a security camera company or something and um he was like, all right, guys, like have a good flight. And we're just sitting in the car. Like everyone's kind of zoning out, like probably going to go sleep for five hours back to Michigan. We're tired. And um, I, I forgot how it came up, but Eric found out I wasn't in first class with him. And he was like, oh, no, dude, like we run together. Like, why aren't you in first? I was like, I don't know. I didn't book it. Like so-and-so at the company booked it. And Eric doesn't book it. I don't book it. We didn't know. And I've never flown first ever. It's never been the scenario. It never should be the scenario. And Eric was like, no, that's not how we roll. Like we're, we're a team. We roll together, like call Delta. And I was like, okay. And I called Delta and Eric took the phone. He's like, Hey, just use my card, upgrade him. Like whatever. It doesn't matter what it costs us to upgrade him. Like he's our team. And it was just the coolest, like, like father figure, weird experience that I've ever <laughs> like, had. And I, and yeah, it was just, it was just weird. It was cool um, to see him actually care about his employees that made under 20 grand a year. Like he cared about everyone, no matter what. Um, and that, yeah, that was a cool experience. So what are some other things you learned from Eric, just being in such close proximity to him all the time? Like what are some of your takeaways from your time with him? That family is pretty important, man. Like I, I think people don't see that a lot on his end because he purposely leaves it out. Um, but it's a lot of the reason why I'm moving back to Michigan in a month is because like, I'm like, all right, well, I know I've always wanted a house in Michigan. Um, because family did like has always meant a lot for me, um, and, and friends and stuff. I have a lot of friends back there. So it, it's always like, I've known I've always wanted to go back at some point and maybe not even live there, but have a house there and feel like I'm a part of it and, and maybe come back for five months out of the year, like whatever. Um, but now that COVID happened, it seems like better time than ever. You might as well go and try something new. And I won't be surrounded by this LA culture anymore, but this past year, my LA culture has been me sitting in my office in my own house, like not doing anything, but working on my laptop. So I don't know when it's going to return. Um, but yeah, I think Eric just showcasing like how much he truly cared about his family and his wife has MS and like how financially 
if you can't afford to make something work and, and, you know, his wife had MS and the medication costed 10 grand a month. And so for him, that was like a hard hurdle to get past and be able to make. Um, and finally, you know, by the time I worked with him, he was well off, didn't matter anymore. Right. But, um, stuff like that, just like seeing that if he saw a tribulation or trial in his life that stopped him, um, because of financial reasons or where you live or family or whatever it is, like he just never let anything stop him. And he always, every single day woke up at 3 AM and went on his walk and like gathered his thoughts. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything specific. The family thing impacted me for sure. And I'm you know, glad I got to see him be such a good dad and husband, but um, I, there was nothing specific that I, I'll forever remember as like that moment. We said the first class thing was cool, but that wasn't like a huge learning experience. Right. But I did just being around him all the time. It was just like an on, you know, an unlimited amount of happiness and, and motivation and po not happiness, just positivity and motivation that you, you didn't see anywhere else. And then when I went and met Gary V's team, it was like the same thing where like Elliot was just such a happy dude. And like, always happy and excited to like meet people and do things. And you didn't always see that like growing up and going to school. It's like everyone's tired and hates it. And like, it was just miserable. And if you ran into an issue, like sometimes it was just like, Oh, well give up and, and figure it out later. Or like whatever the scenario is, but for Eric, it just seemed like nothing ever stopped him. And that was just cool to see. I, I like, I, I think me sitting there and filming him nonstop and hearing him speak even if I blanked out for like hours at a time while he's speaking at an event and I'm just tired, unconsciously hearing his voice and like hearing what he's saying, there's no way my brain's not wired in some weird Eric Thomas way. Now it's got to, it, it has to connect in some way. So I'm glad I did it for sure. It's probably the greatest experience ever. And then talk to me about, so you mentioned LA when you moved from Detroit to LA initially, that's when you stopped working with Eric, you had the spreadsheet applying all these jobs. I think that was around the time Vine closed as well. So like that was it gone was. now. <laughs> yeah. And so like, what's going through your mind at that point? Like, you know, you, you talk about how like back home is kind of like, there's a hurdle and you're kind of like, oh, well, whatever, like we'll deal with it later. We'll just give up. So you're in LA now everything seems to be going the opposite direction you anticipated it going. Like what's keeping you going at that point? Um, I, I think just like the, what I just mentioned, the, the unconscious, you know, mind always telling me that, like, just keep going. It's going to be okay. It'll work out. But man, it didn't feel that way. I remember calling my mom and I'm like, I don't, I don't know what to do. Like I, I, I have a max, like two and a half, three months here before I'm out of money max. Um, and that's pushing it. That's like 18 $19,000 already in credit card debt. Like that's pretty low uh, point in my life. And so I remember calling my mom and being like, what do I do? Like, should I just, me and Josh, the guy that drove with me all the way across the country. Um, I was like, do we just turn around? Like he was still in LA with me. He, you know, he came and he, he was going to fly back a few days later to Michigan. But I was like, do we just turn around? Do we just come back? Like, what am I doing? And she's like, no, like go try it. Go try something. I don't know. And obviously that's probably such a, terrible phone call to get from your son. Like, Hey mom, I'm in LA now. First morning I'm fired and I'm in a city where I don't know anyone and everything's weird. Um, it's probably a weird spot and advice to, to, to give at the time. But yeah, she said, um, you got to try. And so she helped me out with it for sure. Like, um, I wasn't super, super familiar with LinkedIn and how, like I, I had one and like used it from time to time, but she was like the LinkedIn fiend and just taught me on how to like look up the companies you want to work at. Here's how you apply for jobs on easy apply and this and that. Like I had a good ecosystem with my mom and with my roommate, Akil, always being positive and uh, the Eric stuff in my brain and like, you like it. And yeah, it was just a good time and watching Gary V at the time helped a ton. Like that was probably prime. Gary V was January, 2017. That year in 2016, 2017 was like awesome. It was right when he started the daily V's where it just showcased, it was his vlog. Those were really cool to watch. So yeah, I just think staying positive and like networking as much as I could got me through it. And dude, I, I had some pretty rough, like I, I did get a job in February um, it, or no, in March. 
um, right before I got the job in April at Studio 701, I got a job in March. I didn't bring that up before, but I got a job as a valet, a valet attendant. I was going to, you know, work at some random hotel and like car pulls up. I get in and go drive it to the parking lot. Maybe I get five bucks, 10 bucks, whatever. That was, you know, I got a job for that. And the first day at my orientation, I'm sitting there and I remember sitting at a table with all the other people also at orientation. And I just didn't want to be there, man. I was so like, not, I didn't want it at all. The passion just wasn't there. And I get it, like do a hundred percent of everything you do, even if you hate it. But man, I was not hundred percent. I was like maybe 10. I don't even know. I was falling asleep. And the guy next to me nudged me. He's like, dude, come on. Like you're at orientation. Let's go. Like, what are you doing? And I literally was passing out in my chair. I was so tired and just not wanting to be there. Um, and I remember looking at my phone when I'm sitting there and I'm about four hours into this orientation. I look at my phone and I see an email from Studio 71. And they said, hey, like we want to, uh, you, you got, you know, the job offer if you want it. And I, and I remember like looking at it and my eyes got all big and I didn't want to be a, a dick. It's not a movie. I didn't stand up and say, fuck this place and like walk out. But I was like, dude, this is it. Like I'm out. I don't have to do this. And I waited till the end of orientation. It was like another 30 minutes left. And then I, we all took a break and I went up to my future boss at that valet company and said, Hey man, I'm, <laughs> I unfortunately have to quit after today. This is my last day. And he's like, this is your first day. And I was like, no, like I, this is it. I, you know, I'm, I'm done after today. I'm sorry. I got another job and whatever he understood. I'm glad he understood. Um, and, um, I remember getting a check in the mail like five months later for like $41 or something from them because they still legally had to like pay me my four hours of work or whatever. <laughs> so that was kind of funny. But yeah, that was a, a weird, yeah, it was like rock bottom. Those, those three or four months till I got the job straight up rock bottom was down to like my last month. If I didn't get a job in April, it was done. Um, or if I didn't start my job in April, it was done. It, I, I would have had to driven back or I don't know because I was all out of credit card you know, uh, limits. I had maxed all my cards out. Like everything was done. Mm. That was it, man. And it reminds me, I was researching David Dobrik. And one thing advice he got when he first moved to LA was like, you just have to make it for a year and then you'll be okay. Like ever, so many people make it three, four, five, six months and then they're gone. <laughs> yes. So you have to just push through and you have to make it through the first year and then you'll be okay. Yeah. That year sucked. And literally it was exactly year. Cause it, like I said, January, 2017 is when I got there. So it was all of 2017 sucked. And the second I got to move out of that apartment in January 2018 and move into the apartment I wanted to be in closer to work and like I had friends and I enjoyed my job and I was keeping my job and like everything. Yeah, that's so funny that. Yeah, I wonder if there's someone out there that could maybe just like break that cycle and just move here and move straight into what they want and do exactly what they want because that'd, that'd be great. Yeah. And so with Studio 771, you were there for a while. And then I think it was after your first year or so is when they ta they made you director of gaming, right? And you essentially built out their whole gaming arm. Yeah, they um, yeah, they they were um just not into gaming a ton. And it was just such a big space I saw blowing up. And once again, like I feel like I'm so lucky because I was at the right place at the right time, just like I was in Vine, just like I was for Eric Thomas, just like I was for this. Like, I just feel lucky that Fortnite came out in 2017 and was like the biggest game of all time and forever. I don't think any game's gotten that big in a long time. And I just doubled down on that so hard. Still to this day, we work with like the biggest Fortnite creators. But yeah, I, I went so hard in Fortnite and Call of Duty and games that I enjoyed because there was one other gaming guy there. He, he was there. Um he was like higher level than me. And like, he was kind of like my mentor boss ish. And, but he was focused on games that I just didn't even know either existed or didn't enjoy. It was like Minecraft, Roblox, League of Legends, like the stuff like that, that I didn't necessarily play or know how to play or even existed. And um, I was like, where's the, where's the bro games? Where's Madden? Where's Call of Duty? Where's Halo? Where's this stuff? Right. And so that's what the path I went down. And I'm watching this stuff every day in bed anyways, just like going to sleep, watching COD videos or whatever. And so I already knew the ecosystem so well. I knew who I should be emailing. I knew who wasn't big enough to where like they might not have a manager yet, but they're big enough to like, we could help them. So 
yeah, I took that and I ran as fast as I could. And like I said, I hated my apartment living so much in that hour and 20 minute drive. And that was an hour and 20 minutes, like when I leave at midnight. So if I left when everyone else leaves at five, it was like two hours for sure. Um, I just sat there and I just worked all day, every day for literally a full year. I don't, I don't even remember a lot of it. It was like a complete blur. One morning, like I got into such a cycle of waking up, going to work and working 14 hours and then going home that uh, I fell asleep in the car on the way to work and rear-ended just some lady like at a stoplight just because I, like, I was so drained and just working as hard as I possibly could to make this career something that I could actually make money doing because I still was at such like a low salary that it just I was living but that's about it um, I wasn't saving anything but I just wanted it so bad and it was like literally my dream job so I just went so hard and went so hard that I I passed out at the wheel which yeah I don't advise <laughs> and rear-ended a lady and it was a pretty crappy situation that was like immediately when I did it it's like that's a grand uh, you know out of your account and it, a lot of like, you know, the lady gets out, it's all upset. It's just like, a, it's a crappy scenario. So I've had a lot of rock bottoms in that 2017. It was a really rough year. Um, but man, I'm thankful for, for everything that happened because I learned from a lot of it. And if I didn't go through it, I don't like, like that been said, I don't think I would have known what I actually wanted. Mm -hmm. Two things from that. One, I think it's funny how you're talking about how lucky you get, but like hearing that, like the amount of work that you put in is the reason I think you were able to get so lucky. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like it just like Fortnite fell out of the sky and you got the job. You know what I mean? Like you were like, I listened yeah. to Mike Tyson every yesterday. And he said, the harder you work, the luckier you get. And I think that's like indicative yeah. with your story. Like you put in so much work that you were in the position to capitalize on those lucky moments. Definitely. Um, and two, when that rear end happens, is that like a reset for you? Is that like holy shit, you have to like reevaluate everything because you fell asleep at the wheel. You reevaluate not just like um, what you're doing, but like straight up life. Because I took the highway to work, dude. So like if I fell asleep three minutes earlier, I would have been dead, 100%. Like, and it was just so, I was wearing like the coziest like quarter zip sweater. Like the sun was beating on me and like all odds were against me. And I just, I, yeah, I just zonked out for like a few seconds or third, I don't know. And, and I just woke up to like hitting, I remember my water, like splashing up against my windshield and like going everywhere. And, um, somehow the radio started playing and like, yeah, it felt like a movie. You're like, Oh, where am I? What just happened? Kind of thing. And it, it for sure reset like my brain on thinking like, dude, you can't, that's not cool. You can't F around like that. And like, I think. Uh, the night before, like I stayed up a little too late, probably watching some Call of Duty stream or something. And it's like, yeah, that, it's very important. Work is very important. And I'm not denying that, but like, it's not very important if you're dead. So it, you can't, that's like, your health is so important. And when I was just so drained that I passed out, it really did rewire my brain to be like, number one, I was terrified to drive for a little while. I still drove obviously, but like even driving away from that crash site, to the rest of the way to the work was like, you just feel weird. You're like, you're so awake now and you it's adrenaline. And yeah, I, yeah, it's a reset button for sure. I think more so for like your life, not even necessarily like, dude, get your, your work schedule together. It was like, my life was at risk and felt like it was the first time where I really like pushed the boundaries of, of danger and, and like, it wasn't, it wasn't cool. And yeah, my, my parents were pretty upset to hear like, uh, that that happened, but it's never a fun phone call. Like, Hey dad, how does this work? I've never gotten in an accident before, but I just fell asleep, crashed into an old lady. You know, my front Cadillac emblem got smashed into my car. And like, when you rear end someone, you're like hundred percent fault. You can't really explain that to the insurance company. So now not only am I paying for mine, but I'm paying for hers. And, um, yeah, it was, it was luckily a grand. And the way I thought about it was like people, literally people were like, I'm so sorry that happened. That sucks. And I was like, no, dude, I, I feel literally lucky. I got away with learning that like amazing lesson to like take your life a little bit more seriously and organize your schedule a little bit better. So that doesn't happen. And it don't, and I survived and it only costed a thousand dollars. Like I learned such a great lesson for a grand. Unfortunately, the lady still got hit, but like, I think she was okay. But, you know, that was at cost of it too. So, 
And then how much longer after that did you end up starting Baba Media? Um, two years from the, the crash. <laughs> about two years, yeah. I was still at Studio 71 for about another six months. And then that's when I kind of kind of got promoted uh, once just for like doing a good job. And then I remember um, calling my CEO and being like, I, I need more money. Like I, I want to move out of this area. Like I, I need a raise. And I know I just got one, but like 10% of this amount of salary, like a 10% increase of nothing isn't that much, you know? And so although a 10% increase at any job is like a huge bump, usually it just didn't feel like much. And like, it wasn't enough to get me out of that apartment yet. I remember calling my boss and saying that, and he was like, listen, man, if you want more money, like you're doing great, but if you want more money, you need to be doing more things. So what do you plan on doing? And I was like, I'm going to run the gaming department and I'm just pulling shit out of my ass. And like, I just, you know, this is what I'm going to be doing. Of course, this is what I've always had this plan. And, um, yeah. And he's like, well, what are you going to, who are you going to hire? How are you going to run that department? And luckily two nights before I got dinner with another like gaming guy, similar age as me named Jason Wilhelm. And so right when my CEO asked, who are you going to hire? I was like, I'm going to hire Jason Wilhelm. He's going to be my sales guy. And like, I just pulling things out of my brain and I made it work. And then long story short, Jason did come on. And then we both like co-headed the department together. We got an office we hired two talent managers under us and a coordinator and like the, the system started flowing and feeling real. And now I got the cool LA office view. And like, it was once again, like a dream come true. It just kept elevating that, you know, standard of living. And, um, but still, and then Jason kind of realized he didn't enjoy the company cult, like not culture. The culture was great. The company ethics as much as he thought he would. And so he jumped ship after six months. And then I was like, dang, dude, if he could do it, I could probably do it. And it took me about another month or two to make that move myself. Um, and now, you know, I got lunch with that same guy yesterday and we still work together all the time and we're both happy we did what we did. And I'm grateful for the opportunity at Studio 71 and the knowledge I got, but it's just, um, they're also like focused on different stuff. Like they're, they're considered a network and I'm considered like a management company. Like we can still work together in some capacity. So it's not like I was going to like compete against them and start my own thing. It was just, I took the knowledge I wanted and, you know, and the, the good stuff I learned and the bad stuff I learned, like what I don't want. And then I went and did it on my own and left all the bad stuff. And so Man. with Baba Media, was that like, so like you left because you didn't like the company ethics and stuff, but I found some social content from like 2016, 2017. So was this kind of like always the plan and what you were working towards? Yeah. So yeah, we actually, like Baba Media, I said, like you just asked, I didn't start till mid 2019. We tried to start it like me and the Vine buddies, right? We tried to start it after Rise failed. We tried a social media management company. So we started going restaurant to restaurant, walking in and saying, hey, Outback Steakhouse, like you don't run your social media very well. Like, hey, you know, Cabela's, hey, Carabas, hey, you know, all these restaurants. We got to one where it felt like we really were about to like hit something big and make progress. And it was a, the Cadillac dealership I got my car at. And um, they were like, sure, like we'll listen to your pitch. And like, they kind of need to like, go more internet centric anyways, like, sure, let's, let's see your pitch deck or whatever. And we, we regroup, we remake our pitch deck. And I remember we created three tiers and I remember us thinking like, this is Cadillac, they can afford something, you know? So top tier 1500 all the way. That's the top tier 1500 a month. And like, now that I think about that, I'm like 1500 a month, dude, that like, they probably thought we were, that's exactly what they thought. They thought we were kids, like, and we were kids, but like, we went in there with our program of like 500 a month, a grand a month and 1500 a month with four dudes. Like what kind of sustainable business is that? And we're showing them this deck and this video we took of like a Cadillac that they let us borrow for the day and like everything. And um, yeah, when we showed them, they're like, this looks really great guys. Thank you. Like, we'll call you soon. And they just never did. Um, and now that I think about it, like we thought that we were like pushing the limits with that 1500 a month when in reality, they probably thought we were so unprofessional with the fact that our top tier was 1500 a month that they didn't take us. So maybe if we just increase the price more, we would have landed it. Who knows? 
but um <laughs> which is such a weird thing to say if we just call if we just charge them more money we'll make we'll, we'll land it but yeah we tried bava media as a social media management company and inspired by gary v stuff like obviously like we were watching all that and when i heard that he was like working with big brands and running their budgets i was like that's what i want to do like i want I want a new movie to be coming out like Godzilla versus Kong and, and they have a $2 million social media budget and give it to my company. Like, that's what I want. So that what we, that's what we strive for. And we, we landed one client for 600 a month. We did, eh, didn't really know what we were doing and we lost them after a month. And then that was it. And that was like, and we forever still had Baba media, the company and the name, and it was shared evenly between four people. But in 2019, when I decided to leave, I was like, I can't go work on this thing I want to do and then split it between four other people that are still in Michigan and not in this industry anymore. So my buddy was like, yeah, just create a, another Bava Media. Like, keep the name, but just create a different company, Bava. And it's not Bava Media, it's just Bava, but you can brand it as Bava Media. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. And that's what I did. And that's the same company I've been running ever since. And like now full circle, I work with those same friends and guys. And now, you know, one of them's the director of gaming and one of them, you know, the, the two brothers, Brandon and Josh, and then the cousin, Mike. So we've been running the same crew for a long time. And now it's finally like, they feel like jobs, um, but they're jobs that we enjoy. And um, it's sustainable and it's a, a great business and we work with great companies. And yeah, it's, it's a blast, man. And so now like some of the talent you guys have today, correct me if I'm wrong, if this has changed, um, but Ghost Ninja, bucks pack a puncher um big guys millions of followers how'd you get your first client um that yeah so that i mean i got to put all that on studio 71 like they they had the pitch decks they had the pitch like they were you know i would listen in on other talent managers phone calls and like shadow them for a week at a time it was like a four-week thing i'd shadow this one then this one then this one this this one that's your month of training and you'd kind of learn how to um sign somebody in this industry and what the assets of it are and so i signed a ton of talent at studio 71 and eventually learned my way of why i'm bringing value to them um and i remember yeah i remember talking to this guy he finally got back to me and he's like do you want to we can hop on a call sure and i was so nervous and like i hated this i hated that they wanted to do this but they required your boss to listen in on your call your first few calls. And I really didn't want that because it was just making me more nervous. Um, yeah, but he did and whatever you get through them, you just got to get through them. And like the amount of first calls I had where everyone's like, yeah, okay, sure. I'll let you know. And nothing happens. But finally I had another first call and, uh, the guy signed and I was just like, really? And he's like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was like, okay, great. And his name was, uh, Holdacious. He's just some YouTuber. You could, he's still probably uploading and stuff, but I don't really work with him much anymore. But after that Fortnite wave came out, I just tripled down on that industry. And still to this day, like those names you, you mentioned, that's their main niche and what they do on their channel. And when I left Studio 71, um, a lot of them are still in that network and still work with them in other areas, but I'm their manager. They're day to day. Um, and, and we, run their negotiations we help with their taxes we help with all their stuff kind of more so day to day um and so i just brought the same team with me and they were happy to jump with me so it, it worked out well it just kind of reminds me of i interviewed a yes theories manager zach Honnaper. zach yeah yeah he was saying how it's not even a manager it's more he's like i was I'm like creators need ceos instead of managers this way you know what i mean just to run the whole business side and so some of your partnerships here facebook gaming bang ea g fuel g fuel youtube gaming twitch TikTok, are these partnerships like that you've got for all your clients is that what that means like i pulled that off your website yeah um each and every single individual one so like you might see like nesquik or maybe on there it's nestle because i think that's who owns nesquik um and that specifically is only a campaign that we've been running with pack a puncher for almost a year now and so but for us it's showcasing like a great brand that we work with and our great talent that we work with um but yeah facebook gaming for us is, is a huge part of our business and we help scale their their program that they're running there 
Bang Energy, we have a few guys on. And yeah, so like it's it's a little bit of each. Um, every brand you see, we've worked with or work with in, in some capacity um, and have the capability to continue to do so if it makes sense. Um, so that's kind of the asset when we go to a talent and say, hey, I know you're already successful and doing great on YouTube, but we think you could be doing much better. Like here's, here's a few brands that we think might fit well with your demographic. And um, we think we could be that management company for you and help you make more money this year. And so that's what we do. And when they go to our website and see like, oh, okay, they've worked with real companies. It's not just some random shindig, right? It, it helps. Mm -hmm. And then talk to me a little bit more about Facebook gaming. I can remember when I was prepping for this a couple months ago, going on to the, the Bob Media Twitter, and there was a lot of retweets of like people that were partnering when with when Facebook. When you were prepping gaming. this a few months ago. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, sorry about that. It was so, like, I think November, literally. But don't worry, like that that period was like the hardest period I've ever had in my two and a half years doing this podcast to get people. Like it was literally really? like the hardest, like every single, like I normally operate with like a four to six week runway of when my okay. next episode like this will come out <clears throat> mid to late march because i built the okay. runway back up again november december that went down to one week because i was just like everybody oh. i reached out to was like yes and then rescheduled or message me in january like i yeah. can't do it right now and then so it was literally just like that was everybody so like it wasn't just like like there's i've got a couple of podcasts in the next probably two three weeks that i've also prepped for back in november so like it's not just like a, a wow. you thing so it's uh but no this that's what i said a couple months ago because i was i don't know how like if that's changed or not but when i was on there there was a lot of people retweeting like partnering Facebook gaming and stuff like that. So like, why have oh, you guys yep. kind of doubled down with Facebook gaming? Like, what are you seeing from them that you guys are like, yes, we're in? Um, they have, a, you know, Facebook gaming, they, they launched Facebook gaming in general in January uh, of 2018. So right when my life started to get good um, <laughs> after that year of 2017 was over. Uh, that's when they launched. They had their launch event January of 2018. Um, and I've been working with them ever since, but they know they're not, you know, unrealistic with expectations. Like they understand that gaming in general, when people think gaming and live streaming, they think Twitch usually. Um, they are trying to change that precedent and have been for years now. And so to start that off at the launch event, there were 40 initial partnered streamers that they had in their Facebook gaming program. It was like, come on here for a year and like you get, you know, you might get like a salary or like bonuses or like whatever it was. It's changed so much over the years. And now all platforms pay all of their talent in different ways and avenues. But we had 40 talent partnered in the program. And out of those 40 talent, I, my team represented 23 of them. So we had more than 50% of the launch of the program. So I felt really attached and like a part of that Facebook gaming program and the platform itself. And I was really close with the team and I really liked the team. They're professional. I always liked to go into the office because I had free food and the Facebook campuses <laughs> and Twitch never invited me. So what the heck guys? Um, so yeah, I just, the main part of it was like, I saw a program that they were trying to build in a big way. And it seemed like something I wanted to be a part of. And so we started pitching our talent to them and saying, what do you think of this guy? What do you think of this guy? We think this guy might be good for the platform. And when they, um, yeah, when, when they uh, launched, it was just like a wave that created a lot of people started watching gaming content on Facebook. It was a new thing. No one ever should ever go on Facebook prior to 2018 uh, to look up gaming content. It was like just, your grandma complaining about the grocery store being closed or whatever. Like it was Facebook. It's just a toxic timeline sometimes. But now when I go on there because the algorithm, I just see like call of duty and, and Fortnite and Madden and, and FIFA and like stuff I actually want to see. So it, it's cool. But um, yeah, over the years, we've just continued to work with them and I'm pretty close with their team. So when I jumped ship, I started working with them in a much larger way. Um, and actually help run the program on behalf of Facebook rather than just pitching the talent we're working with. Now they're giving us talent and saying, can you go help us uh, get this guy? And so it, it's, it's cool, man. It's a literally like a solid crux of our business and um, some of the best partners we could ever ask for.
and this past yeah Q4 for Facebook gaming, that 2K community is insane on Twitter. I mean, within one week, I think we went from a thousand to almost 2000 followers on Twitter, on Bob Media's Twitter. And <laughs> I've just, I had no idea what was happening. Every single person that was onboarding was tweeting and saying, thanks Facebook gaming. And thanks Bob Media for the opportunity. And it created this like template. Like we didn't ask them, any of them to do this. And then they all started saying the same thing. There's people tweeting it that weren't even in the program. I've never even heard of them. And I was just like, what the heck's going on? Um, but it was really cool to, to see like the wave of people understanding that Facebook gaming is a new way to watch live streaming content. And um, I, yeah, I think they're going places for sure. Like they're, when I think live streaming now, and maybe you have, you know, everyone probably has their different opinion on it, but I think Twitch, Facebook gaming, and YouTube gaming, they're like the three really solid heavy hitters in the space that provide really good content and, and um, a good, you know, home for gaming live streaming. I just realized at times I'm going to jump here and kind of get closer to these wrap up questions. Sure. I'm sorry. I did not realize how long we've been going here. Um, All good, man. What's the long-term vision for Bava Media? Kind of looping back to what I said I wanted the first Bava Media to be, where like a movie comes out and the Congress Godzilla budget is ours to, to promote, right? That's what I see, but more so honed in on um, brands because um, they have, it's not a movie that happens once. It's like, hey, for Q1 or Q2, we have a budget of this. And we need this amount of impressions focused on this vertical. We're trying to perfect that business. And there's a lot of people out there doing it, but we're really close and working well with the talent. So we can kind of do both sides of it in one company where usually they don't do that. Um, that's why companies like Studio 71 aren't always necessarily so close to their talent. They're more so focused on the business side of it. We're trying to do both and mash them together. Um, better than anyone else ever has um, and, and make it a success. So, yeah, I, I, I don't think it's, you know, it, it's not the uh, end goal, but I would say I'd like to be in the gaming space forever. I know it's just going to keep growing and growing and growing and growing. And so if it's not Bava Media, maybe it's like a, a controller company or this or that. And like, you know, I've been recently looking to get into a lot of different opportunities and investment opportunities with different companies and advise, you know, different companies. Cause there's so, I even explained like the tech of aggregating content has been growing so much. Like there's cool concepts you can do to help this business, the core business Bava that we're running grow that I'd love to continue growing. So in general, just continue to evolve the gaming space and maintain like good culture. Because the talent management space can be pretty toxic at times, and we're not one of those companies and don't want to be. So we're, we're just going to keep pushing along with, with the solid partners we have, and it's, it's going to keep growing and growing and growing. I have a message here from Scott Birdie I wanted to read to you. Okay. And so the first, it starts off, most of all, he's having fun and living his life, which is the most awesome part. Also, you have to bring up Delta Airlines and rewards. That'll prompt a good conversation. <laughs> I mean, yeah, this, it's a big part that I did leave out was, was my Delta career in general, not career. I didn't work there, but that roommate that worked at, um, or not worked that did the MLM, uh, it was called Vima at the time. I don't know if you've heard of it. It was like an energy drink company, multivitamin, like herbal life. Like you've heard of that kind of stuff or like Mary Kay for girls, right? He was in one of those. And with that, just brutally honest, like comes a lot of fake facades at the beginning. Like if you don't have a whole pyramid under you yet, you're making dirt and paying for your way into this thing. And you got to pretend like you're killing it. So people sign up under you. Right. And so he worked at Delta airlines at the time still does. Um, he's, I don't know what he's doing now. He's on like a leave because of COVID you can like take time off for free if you want and stuff. So, but he's still, uh, you know, back in 20, 15 or 16, he started working at Delta Airlines when he was 18 years old. And so now he's been there forever. He has seniority. But when you start at Delta Airlines, a lot of people, what they don't know is you get free flights. 
your parents get free flights. And if you have kids, they get free flights. And if you have a, if you have a wife, she gets free flights or, or a husband. Um, and if you don't have a wife or a husband, then there's not a, you know, there's still like an available slot for that. And they don't call it, you know, a wife or husband spot, but they call it like your companion. And I was his roommate and we were, got super close and started going to these motivational speaking events. And he's like, dude, I have this companion slot open. It, it, it's a year long thing. Like I can put you in the spot and we can just go f- fly everywhere. And I was like, absolutely, man, that would be the greatest experience ever. Right. And so he put me in that companion spot. And then that was also why I was such a big asset to Eric Thomas and associates. Not only was I the one with no children or parents or or I had parents, children or, um, you know, schedules or kids or anything like that. But I also had free flights. They didn't have to pay for our flights to go to the Gary V thing. That's why it was me and Akil that went right. And so we just lived it up on these free flights for like two years. Keep in mind, there were some tough times. Like you're on standby. You only get on if there's an open seat. You can't take a paid ticket. So if there's no open seat, you're like the gate closes and you're just sitting there in the airport. Like (laughs) now what do you do? And you just wait another three hours till the next flight or leave, like go home. If you, if maybe there was the last flight of the day. And so I've slept on many airport floors for years and I, and I, you know, waited and sat in airports for like hours and hours, hours. I was stuck in Dallas for like nine hours. One time that was a pretty rough experience. Like a lot of stuff like that. And when you don't have money, you don't even want to leave because you can't go stay in a hotel. It's just going to cost more money. So you just stay in the airport and are miserable until you can get on a flight that's open to go somewhere. So that was like my start to Delta. And I realized because of Akil, he explained pretty well that, um, that Delta is like the best airline ever to work for. They're the greatest. And uh, they have really clean planes and a great program. And they're based out of Atlanta and Detroit, which is where we were based at the time. And um, yeah, it was, it was awesome. So ever since I've gotten off of that companion pass in like 2019 um, is when I, I think I was like, Hey, you can give it to someone else. Like I don't, I'm working at studio 71 now. I can't really use it if I wanted because it's just too like risky. If I miss a flight to go home for the holidays, my mom's going to kill me. I got to buy it. Um, so yeah, I, I, we, I gave it up in 2019. And then ever since now I'm obsessed with like the status of main, like getting high status. So I can sit first class without buying first class. Right. So I am married a hundred percent to Delta airlines. I haven't flown another airline in years and I refuse to, and yeah, man, I'm, I'm platinum medallion, uh, almost diamond medallion, which is the highest st- status you can get. And so I buy main cabin tickets and get promoted to, to first class almost every flight. I'm going to Vegas tomorrow. I bought main cabin for the cheapest amount. And usually before the flight, about a day before, you'll get an upgrade to first almost every time, especially this year with COVID. It's like half capacity, right? So no one's on the plane anyways. Um, so yeah, I get upgraded almost every time and it's great. I'm, I think I truly believe if you like, you like a company and you decide to marry that company and only fly with them or in other scenarios, like when I go to Vegas, I only stay at the Cosmo, uh, the next, the three nights that I'm staying at the Cosmo, I'm only paying for one of them. The other two are free just cause like, if you marry that company, it's going to suck at the beginning and you're going to be like, I'm spending a lot of money and I have no status but it eventually catches up and you start, they start appreciating your business. And yeah, so I've, I've had my friendly competition Delta um, benefits kind of career with many other CEOs and people you've probably interviewed over, over the time. And platinum is where I'm at right now. And I'm really upset. My buddy Dylan Drews got to diamond before me, but it's okay. I'll, I'll get there soon. That's amazing. I love that. I had no idea like what to expect with that. Like all I, that was the, all the context I had. So I had no idea where that was going to go. Um, but that's awesome. But no, I'm going to jump to my last question. I ask this question to everybody. Um, so pretend you have a crystal ball. You can ask this crystal ball any question. You'll get the 100% honest answer. What's one question you want to know the answer to? Um, man. That's a hard one. I really, I don't like when people ask, like, if you could find out when you die, do you want to know? Because my answer is always no. And um, 
and same goes for like loved ones and stuff like that. Like, I just don't want to know that kind of stuff. And I don't know why my brain goes towards that, like negativity, but like the crystal ball, man. Um, Cause even if it was something like financially related, if I'm like, am I going to be a millionaire? What if it's a no? And then I'm like, dang, that sucks. And then I just stop working. <laughs> That's a hard one, man. I I'd say, um, am I, uh, going to regret moving back to Michigan is, is a big thing on my mind lately. And I'd love to see that crystal ball. And if it's, it's fine. If it's a no, cause it's not the end of the world, I can move somewhere else, but I would really like to know if I'm going to regret going back. Cause I'm waiting as long as I can dude. Like, cause it's cold as shit right now. And so I'm waiting another month until March. It's still going to be cold, but it's going to be evolving into summer soon. So uh, a lot of people are teasing me about it. A lot of my LA friends are like, dude, you're leaving LA really the prettiest, you know, place ever. And like, you know, it's Hollywood, baby, you got to come here. And I've just had it, man. It's, it's been four years and it's, it was a blast. I'm glad I did it, but I just think it's time for a change. And it's also not the end of the world. Like I can come back. I'd love to own a home here and in Michigan. And I'd love to buy, you know, that home here. And maybe in, when I'm 31 or 32 or something like that in five or six years, but yeah, it's, um, yeah, I'd say, am I going to regret moving to Michigan? Fair enough, but I appreciate your time. I want to give you the floor. Where can the people find you plug anything and everything you got right now? Um, yeah, man, I, I really don't post too much anymore, to be honest, but you probably saw you're like trying to do research. You're like, dude, he hasn't posted since last year. What the hell's going on? But, um, I'd like to, I, I post stories still. So like maybe some of those, but Instagram, it's just Fenwick. It's my last name. Um, yeah. And then, and then Twitter, I think it's just Ryan Fenwick with two K's. Um, and that's about it, man. Check out our website. If you want to do business with us, bafamedia.com. And yeah, I'm happy to, you know, come on here. I was, I was glad I finally made it happen. Sorry about the delay, man, but it was, you're a great dude. I'm so happy that this is all attached to true fan. Are you required to wear? No, that's <laughs> funny. Actually. No, I was actually just wearing it. Cause they sent it to me a couple months ago and now it's just part of my regular outfit rotation. Well, so good. I'm glad you know, I'm glad. Um, yeah. cool, man. It was great to be on. I really appreciate it. And I, I can't wait to watch more, I, you know, more people that you have on here. You've already had a ton of my buddies. So I'm curious to see where it keeps going. I'm sure it'll keep growing. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. I want to thank, thank you once again for taking time to be in the show. And I want to thank everybody for listening, whether you've listened the entire way through, you only listen to bits and pieces. I really appreciate it. Take time to check this out. Everyone do me a big favor. Go and follow Ryan. Go and check out Bava Media. I'll make sure everything's linked in the show notes down below so you can find it. Like to follow me. You can find me everywhere on social media at the Jacob Kelly. Feel free to come and say hello. My DMs are always open. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. Thank you once again for listening, everybody. We'll talk soon. Boom.